come to some of the verses that sort of are that are at the heart of his ideas and at the heart of this letter and what makes it so inspiring and one of the verses that are, are perhaps most familiar in the book of Philippians he says I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings to become like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. This is God's word for God's people this morning. You know, what does it mean to know Christ? It strikes me that here's Paul writing decades and decades after he came to faith and he's been an apostle for decades. He's written some of the New Testament already and, and you ask him what he really wants at this stage in his life and he says, I want to know Christ. And you say, Paul, don't you already know Christ? I thought you were a believer and stuff. But apparently for Paul, there's a deeper level. There's more to it than, than he, even he knows already. And, uh, you know, this is true in all of our circumstances, all of our situations. You know, you think about our relationships with people. Uh, you can know somebody by name, you can know somebody by faith, you can know them personally, or you can have a deeper, more involved, more intimate relationship or partnership with a person. And, and, and there's a great significance in the difference between someone you know because they're a celebrity and everybody knows them, everybody recognizes them, and somebody you know because they're a member of your family and you've been with them for years and you've been with them through the ups and downs and you've you've helped each other through the challenges that you faced one kind of knowing is just a superficial download of data but then there's another kind of knowing somebody maybe because of the challenges you've been through together maybe because of the way you've helped each other maybe because of the way you've sacrificed for each other or because of the way you've supported each other that can be life changing and so Paul says you know he says in another place if we think we know we don't yet know as we ought to know because knowing Christ is something that is a lifetime pursuit and so that's what I want to talk about today. And, and, you know, he binds the knowing of Christ up to knowing who, who Jesus is and what he did. For Christians, we talk about and we celebrate the, our knowledge of Christ by thinking of his work. You know, on Christmas, he became one of us. On Good Friday, he died in our place. And then on the first Easter, he rose again. And it's through knowing knowing Jesus in his resurrection, knowing Jesus in his incarnation, knowing Jesus in his atonement, and, and plumbing the depths of that, that we begin to know Christ. And he breaks it down into four things here. One, he talks about knowing a power that can transform us. He says, I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection. T to be a follower of Christ is to know that he... He came and became one of us. He came and sacrificed himself for us. And then he came and he conquered our greatest enemy when he conquered death for all of us. And that's the heart of the gospel is it's about what Jesus has done for us, not what we do for him. And I think this is what makes Christianity and the gospel different than and basically any other relationship that, w that we might find ourselves brought into and different than, different than any other religion that we might find ourselves engaged in is that we don't change, we don't change ourselves in order to know Christ. We know Christ and then he changes us. We don't fix our lives up so that we can know Christ, we meet Christ, and then he transforms our life. And that's the power of the resurrection working towards us and working in us, working through us. Knowing Christ in his life, knowing Christ in his death, knowing Christ in his resurrection becomes, if we know that, it becomes a life-changing power. And that's the mystery of the gospel, and that's, that's the supernatural aspect of the Christian life. In Romans 6, Paul puts it this way, We've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, we too might live a new life. 
You know, this is, this is the opportunity of the gospel, that, that the power that raised Jesus from the dead, that's always used throughout the New Testament as, as the basis for us understanding what the power of God in our life is like, what the power of God in the face of whatever challenges we might be facing is. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, can be at work in our lives, can be at work in our circumstances, can be at work in us to help us get through whatever we need to get through. And so you look at your own life and you look at the problems you have, you look at the sin patterns you have, you look at the addictions you struggle with, with the bad habits that are gobbling up your life and the bad paths that you're on. It's the power of the resurrection that can change us. But we don't transform ourselves so that we can know Christ. We know Christ. We meet Christ and realize that he knows us completely and gave himself for us. And that's what changes us. We meet Christ and we realize that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is also going to give life to our bodies and help us to overcome the challenges that we are facing right here and right now. And so that's what Paul means that when he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. He looks at his life where he's at and he says, you know, there's things in my life that aren't right. There's things in my life that aren't good. But the power of the resurrection can help me get through these things. So to know Christ is to know the power of his, his resurrection. It's a power that can transform us. And also, he says, it's a power that can console us. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. You know, that's kind of weird the first time you read it, maybe your first impression of it. You say, Paul wants to suffer? Is he some kind of a masochist that's just looking for agony? I mean, I find in my life, I don't have to go looking for agony. Agony just finds me in various places. But, but that's not what he's talking about, I think. I think what Paul is saying is that the reality is life is suffering. And all of us face suffering in various ways and various places. You don't have to go looking for suffering. Suffering finds you. And the question is, when you're facing the suffering, how are you facing it? Or when you're facing the suffering of life, how, how are you experiencing it? And, and the question is, are you experiencing it completely alone or are you experiencing it with other people? And I've found in life, in my own life and in the lives of other people that when we go through, the, the worst part about going through something is if you're going through it completely alone. If you're going through a heartbreak, if you're going through a loss, if you're going through a devastation or an agony and you're completely alone in it. That, that's when the suffering becomes unbearable. But on the other hand, one of the things I've noticed over the years is if you go through something as a family or you go through something with some close friends and you go through something and you feel connected to other people who are going through it too, the suffering can actually be a positive. The suffering actually becomes something that can bring you together. Suffering can be something that that takes a superficial relationship and brings it to a deeper level. I mean, we think we even build this into our life. You know, why do a lot of sports, when you, when you go out for your high school sport, they, they incorporate Hell Week into it? Why is that? It's, well, to get, get everybody back in shape, but also because going through all that agony is what brings a team together. Or, or you think of a boot camp experience in the military, this, this sense that everybody's gone through this difficult initiation means everybody is bound together, everybody has something in common. And I've just seen this over, over the years with, with families that have gone through tremendously difficult times. If they go through that, those things together, if they go through those difficult times with a commitment to one another, even through those difficulties, they're bound closer together, even through those difficulties. Those, those difficulties don't destroy them. They make them stronger because they are not alone. And, you know, I think if we went through this room today and everybody was able to go into a private confessional booth and talk about the things that, that they were struggling with and the sufferings and the uncertainties and the fears that they carry right at this moment, and then we were to play all those back anonymously, we'd be overwhelmed with even the suffering, even the worries, even the, the anxiety and the agonies that are contained right in this place today. But 
what it means to be a follower of Christ is there's a fellowship of his sufferings because everything we've gone through, we go through, he's gone through before us. And we have a God who has entered into the sufferings of this world to redeem us from the sufferings of this world. If you're familiar with the life of Christ, if you've read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the New Testament stories of the life of Christ, one of the things you see is that Jesus, Jesus went through a version of almost everything that we deal with. He he dealt with uh, poverty. He dealt with being a migrant and being on the run. He dealt with si significant family problems. When he was a young adult, his brothers and his mother thought he had lost it. His father, it seems like his father was out of the picture at a young age. He uh, dealt with, he poured his life into 12 people, and then when the the crunch time came, all 12 of them abandoned him and betrayed him, and then the authorities arrested him and he was falsely accused and condemned. He dealt with humiliation, and he even dealt with spiritual alienation. At the end of his life, he's hanging on the cross and he calls out to God himself and says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, the life of Jesus was a life of entering into the suffering of all of us. And so when we are going through the suffering that we experience in this life, the, that's an inevitable part of life, the Christian message is that God has come down and he's entered into our suffering. And so through our suffering, we can meet him through our suffering we can actually go deeper in our faith if we experience our suffering by faith. It says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Just as we share abundantly in the suffering of Christ, so also through Christ our comfort abounds. You know, the fellowship of his suffering means that we face the difficulties that we face, and everybody faces difficulties. It's not just you. It's everybody else too. We all face that. But when we go through them together, they actually are an opportunity to go deeper in our experience of the gospel, deeper in the experience of his grace. So whatever you're going through right now, if you're following Christ, the message is you're not alone in that. He is with you. And that's the promise of God for the children. So Paul says, you have power for transformation through the power of the resurrection. You have comfort, a presence and consolation through the fellowship of his suffering. But you also can have courage in devastation. Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. I mean, Paul, not only is he a masochist, but he also has this death witch. I want to become like him in his death. You wonder where that's coming from or what he's thinking about that. What, you know, uh, so here we are and, and it's, it's 110 degrees out and we're thinking, well, if I wanted to become like him in his death, all I need to do is sit, and, sit out in the parking lot for about 10 minutes and I'd be there. But, uh, but that's not what we're encouraging. What I want you to see, if you look at the life of Jesus, one of the things you notice is Jesus knew from the get-go that his life was not going to end well. He knew, you know, at the very beginning he's called and, and someone, and John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who carries away the sin of the world. What were the lambs that carried away the sins of the world? Those were the lambs upon which, upon, that were slaughtered and sacrificed at, at Passover. It wasn't a good thing to be the lamb that was going to be carrying the sin. But that was the burden and the mission that Jesus had from the very beginning. And he went through his whole life knowing where it would end. But he went through with a certain resolve. In Matthew 22, it puts it this way. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, and on the way he took the twelve disciples and said to them, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over the chief priests, the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and he will hand him over to the Gentiles. So he mocked and flogged and, and crucified. So imagine that. Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen, down to the details. He's going to be handed over, he's going to be mocked, he's going to be flogged, he's going to be crucified. He, he knows exactly what's going to happen to him, and yet he's got absolute resolve and focus and confidence. And knowing that that's going to happen, he goes to Jerusalem anyways. 
He could have said, you know, if I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be mocked and flogged and crucified, so I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to, I'm going to take off. But he doesn't do that. He says, we're going to Jerusalem, and this is going to happen. And you've got to understand that in Jesus' day, in Jesus' life, this meant, meant his whole mission was a total failure. There was no place in first century Jewish expectation for a Messiah who was crucified because the Messiah was supposed to be the triumphant leader who would restore Israel to power and to glory. And so a Messiah, you know, plenty of people came along and said they were the Messiah and then the Romans came and, and captured them and executed them and crucified them. And, and that meant you weren't the Messiah by definition because a Messiah was supposed to triumph. A Messiah was supposed to be someone who experienced victory. But Jesus found his victory and Jesus accomplished his victory through his suffering and through his death because he knew what his suffering and his death was going to lead to, right? He knew his suffering and his death was going to lead to resurrection. In John 12, he puts it this way. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, then it produces many seeds. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So what does the death and resurrection mean? of Jesus mean for those who follow Christ? You know what it means? It means that in your life there might be tragedies. No, in your life there will be tragedies, but there's no tragedy in your life that, can, that is not going to be redeemed by the power of God and by the grace of God. There's no evil in your life that's not going to be re redeemed by the goodness of God. There's no agony in your life that's not going to be redeemed by the comfort of God. There's no injustice in your life that's not going to be redeemed by the grace of God. There's no loss in your life that's not going to be redeemed by the generosity of God. There's no pain in your life that's not going to be redeemed by the healing of God. That's what the resurrection means. And to know the power of the resurrection, to become like him in his death, it's a certain kind of death. It's a death that leads to new life. And that's what we are invited invited to. And that's the story of the life of Jesus, that the greatest injustice, the greatest agony, there was no greater injustice than when the, the holy, perfect Son of God was condemned and crucified. There was no greater agony than when the sinless one was forsaken by his Father and was made to bear the sins of the world. There was no greater humiliation than when the all-glorious Son of God was hung naked on a cross to suffer and to die in weakness, but all of his agony, all of his humiliation, all of his suffering redounded to his ultimate victory. And if God is able to do that through his loss and through his tragedy, God is going to do that through yours. That's the hope and the promise that he gives to all the followers of his. And this is hard to believe when you're going through it. You know, I've preached this message in various variants for many, many decades, but about five years ago, I was going through a stage when I was actually losing everything that I had worked for and everything that was important to me. And people tried to share this message with me. And I said, well, this case is different. This is worse. <laughs> this is not something that was anticipated. But you know, what I found and what I discovered over the years is, is even the difficulties I was going through that seemed irredeemable and seemed unfixable and seemed like nothing good could come out of them, those were, those were the things God was using to move me into a new phase of life and into a new vista of ministry and into a new plan and new calling for my life. And so God does that for all of us, whatever our tragedies, whatever our loss might be, if we will simply trust in him. That's what it means to to uh, know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, to become like him in his death. It gives us courage in the face of whatever devastation life throws at us if we look to him and if we can believe in him. So we look at Jesus and all of the tragedies of our life can be in perspective. That's what it means to live by faith. 
for those of you who are going through devastation right now, to look at the resurrection of Christ, to look at, at that as the thing that God is going to do in your life, in his way, as you continue to follow him. And then finally, I want to talk about ultimate restoration. Paul says, I want to become like him in his death, and so somehow, some way, to experience the resurrection from the dead. You should know the story. Jesus died, and then three days later, he rose again from the dead with a new life, a new body, and that was the victory that was the beginning of the new kingdom, the beginning of the restoration of all things, including the lives and the hearts of everybody who will follow him. Jesus didn't just rise and conquer death for himself. He rose and he conquered death for everybody who would believe in him. He rose and conquered death to give all of us who are going to live and die a reason for eternal hope. And, you know, this life, there are harsh realities with this life for all of us. Sometimes it's plans that don't work out or we make plans for our life and they do work out and then we discover too late that they were bad plans. Um, sometimes, you know, we have relationships that we don't have that cause pain or relationships that we do have that we have for our whole life that cause pain. Uh, you know, our bodies that are, are imperfect or injured or, or sick or ultimately break down and it's frustrating as you go through life to deal with these things. I mean, a lot of you people are young, but some of you know what it's like to go into the doctor and you have some problem and you're thinking, well, I'm gonna go to the doctor and the doctor's gonna fix this problem. And instead, what does the doctor say? The doctor says, you know, can't really solve this. You're just going to have to learn to live with this. And you're like, no, I want you to heal this. And the doctor says, sorry, you know, medical science isn't there yet. You're going to have to live with that achy knee or that achy foot or, or that discomfort or, or that pain or that limitation. And, and it's a tremendously frustrating thing when it happens to you. And, uh, you know, Ben, give it time. It will. Um, <laughs> But, 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 you know, it's, it's frustration, frustrating in this, in the, one of the frustrations of this life is how our bodies break down because we kind of know what we want to be and what we ought to be and how we were designed to be and then things don't work the way or stop working the way they should be or we realize we're going to live with chronic discomfort or chronic pain or chronic disability and, 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 uh, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. Or we have these dreams of, of what we're going to accomplish in our life. We have these dreams of what our family is going to look like in our life. And then as, as life unfolds, we realize our family is going to be something different. Or we're living our life or our loved ones are living their life and they come to an end. And we realize this person's life is over and it's an unfinished story. And how do you find hope? in the face of the unfinished story that most of our lives are going to be. And the promise of the gospel is there is hope because of the hope of resurrection. The story of Jesus was an unfinished story when he hung on that cross, but it came to its climax when he rose from the dead. And the, your story is probably going to be an unfinished story when your family and loved one comes to your funeral or your memorial service, but all of the meaning and all of the glory of that story is going to come together one day when, when you experience final restoration. And this is the hope of the, because life is so frustrating and life just doesn't work out in so many ways and so many circumstances. And we have these, these physical pains and these personal pains that we just live with. And, and I think one of the things that, that becomes so discouraging is when you realize this is, this is what my life's going to be. But that ideal of what your life is supposed to be, that does, ideal of the life that you long for, that's realized through the restoration of all things. That's realized through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the hope that inspires all followers of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul puts it this way, our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 
We don't even know how the various pieces of our life are going to fit into a bigger story and a greater story than anything that we can imagine. We don't know that. We can't know that. But we can embrace that. We can believe that. We can trust in that in the midst of the mayhem and the confusion of our life right here and right now. And, I, you know, I've, what I've realized is, is you know, this, this doctrine and this truth is, is tremendously important for people who are struggling, for people who perhaps have chronic disabilities or, uh, or tragedies in their life at, at an early stage and live a life where they can never really get, ne never really get going and, and things just don't turn out well and, they're and, and all of life is a struggle and all of life is a series of broken relationships and, and broken dreams and broken hopes and, and broken bodies, frankly. That, to know that you have new life and eternal life to look forward to can be an encouragement for when you're in that situation. But I've noticed that it's also something that's necessary for the people who live the greatest lives and the most impressive lives and the most successful lives because sometimes greatness and success and accomplishment kind of mocks you at the end of your life when you come to the end of it. I, you know, I, I recently saw a, a current interview with Warren Buffett, and I realized, you know, this guy is really rich, but you know what he also is? He's really old. He, in fact, he's 88 years old right now, and all of his money can't make him 24 again, you know? And, and uh, the reality is that all of his fame, all of his success, all of his fortune is going to disappear and be left behind. And so even the people who accomplish the most, even the people who succeed the most, even the people who have the most to live for, ultimately, we have to let it go. But the promise of the gospel is, is that there's some, there is something to look forward to. And the promise of the gospel is that that desire for a perfect body, that desire for a perfect life, that desire for perfect love, that desire for perfect community, that desire for beauty, that desire for glory that resides somewhere deep in all of us, although we've suppressed it and we've denied it and we try to pretend it's not there, but it's, it's deep down in there for all of us, that desire will ultimately be fulfilled in the resurrected life. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, when I find in myself desires that nothing in this world, nothing in this life can satisfy, maybe that should point me to the fact that I'm made for another world, that I've got another life to live for, that, that our unsatisfied desires, that our broken hearts, our broken dreams, our broken bodies, what does that point us to if we, if we look at them by faith? It points us to the promise and the hope that there's something beyond this life. That Jesus didn't just rise from the dead so that he could live forever. He rose from the dead so that you could live forever, so that you could have a new life, and so that you could have hope right here and right now in the midst of this life, such as it is, that things are going to work out in a way that's more glorious than anything we can imagine if we'll simply trust in him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that Jesus entered into our broken world, our broken lives, our broken hearts. And I pray that you would help us to live by faith, that you would help each one here to really know him, that in knowing him, we might be transformed by him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.